Hello everyone and welcome back for chapter three, the cell. In previous biology courses, you probably learned that prokaryotic cells are smaller and simpler than eukaryotic cells. And that the most important difference between them is that prokaryotes lack a nucleus. A nucleus is an organelle within the cell, as seen depicted in this image, that is surrounded with a lipid membrane and it houses the chromosomes or genetic information of the cell. Within biology, there are two major classifications of cells. Prokaryotic, from the words pre-nucleus, and eukaryotic, from the words true nucleus. So cells of microbes can be either of the two. Viruses are neither prokaryotic or eukaryotic, and we'll discuss them later in the course. Prokaryotes and eukaryotes can be divided amongst other traits as well. Of course, the DNA location being the most important, uh, prokaryotes contain a nucleoid, which means nucleus-like, and it is an irregularly shaped region within the cell of a prokaryote that contains all or most of the genetic material, which is called a genophore. Their chromosomes vary as well. Prokaryotes have circular genomes and tend to be a single copy, whereas eukaryotes have linear chromosomes and they tend to be multiple. Prokaryotes also do not have histones, while eukaryotes do have histones. Histones are proteins that are used to pack the genetic information tightly. Membrane-bound organelles are not found in prokaryotes, or if there are, there are just a few of them, whereas eukaryotes have an assortment of them. The cell wall material in prokaryotes is peptido, has peptidoglycan, whereas in eukaryotes you can find chitin, cellulose, or others. Replication in prokaryotes occurs through binary fission, whereas in eukaryotes it occurs through mitosis. As you should recall, there are three domains of life, the eukarya, archaea, and bacteria. We will focus primarily on bacteria because they are well studied. They are implicated, as far as we know, much more significantly in human disease, and because we know almost nothing about archaea. We will also briefly cover eukarya, which contain the fungi, protozoa, algae, and helmets. And at some point, we'll get in greater detail of viruses. Prokaryotic cell morphology comes in three different shapes. Caucus, which is spherical or ovoid. Bacillus, which is rod-like. And spiral, which is corkscrew. Note in this image, the caucus, which is on the left-hand side, can sometimes have the appearance of a bacillus bacterium. That is due to the fact that this, is, this particular bacterium is going through binary fission. And if one looks carefully, they will see a little invagination of the cell wall, which indicates that this cell is going through division. Take a moment and try and remember why cell morphology is so important to microbiology. If you say it's important because it is necessary for the identification of microbes, you are right. Bacteria also have different arrangements. In this image, you can see uh, diplococci and streptococci. What determines the arrangements is the plane of division that occurs in the bacterium. If a bacterium divides along only one plane for each of its progeny, then you can either have a diplococci or streptococci. Diplococci divide on a single plane and remain in pairs together. However, streptococci divide in a single plane and they remain attached in long chains. Again, note the size of the microbes we're looking at with the scale bar. These microbes are on the range of about 0.8 to one and a half microns in size. It may be confusing at times because these can make what appears to be a spiral shape. 
But note that we are, this is made up of individual cells, so this would be a streptococci. Again, because plane of division determines the arrangement of the bacterial cells, if a bacterium divides on two different planes, as in this uh, image in B, it becomes a tetrad, meaning that there are four bacterial cells that can remain as a group. If a bacterium dis divides on one, two, three different planes, we can have a sarcanine. If the bacterium remains as a group, in which we have eight bacterium attached to each other. Lastly, if we have a bacterium that divides all over the place, we can have clusters. These clusters form staphylococci in this image here. They are called staphy, staphylo because they resemble bunches of grapes. Most bacterium are single. In this example here, we have a single bacillus, and occasionally you might see single bacillus attached to each other, but as we can see, these cells are not a full length cell, so this indicates that these cells are going through binary fission. However, in example B, we can see that these cells can often remain as partners, even as we see here in a full size. So these are referred to as diplobacilli. If you see in a culture that the majority of cells are diplobacilli and they, for the most part, look like full grown cells, you are likely looking at a true diplobacilli. If you see many of them as a single bacterium, you're probably looking at a single bacillus. If these bacilli remain attached to their polar regions to each other, then we can have a streptobacilli. Sometimes these bacterium are somewhere in between and have an identity crisis. So these bacterium are called, called coxobacillus. They are a truncated form of a true bacilli, but not quite round enough to be a coccus in shape. You should be able to identify these stubby individuals from their more slender bacilli if given an example in an image. Not all bacterium choose to be perfectly straight. Some bacterium have curves in them. If a bacterium has a single curve in it or mild curves in it, it is referred to as a vibrio. If that bacterium has many curves in it and has this rigid corkscrew-like morphology, it is called a spirillum. Note the thickness of the wall in relationship to the length of it. You should be able to tell the difference between that and the spirochete. Spirochetes are very flexible and have very thin bodies to them. Sometimes osmosis can affect the shape of a cell wall. Osmosis is the movement of solvent molecules. In the case of biology, this tends to be water across a semi-permeable membrane that allows the ability of those water molecules to move across the membrane while most solutes cannot. Water will always move across the gradient to try and balance out the concentration of solutes within and outside of that membrane. This image here shows how osmosis affects the shape of the cell walls. In image A, there is an isotonic solution. An isotonic solution means that the amount of solutes inside and outside of the cell are roughly the same in concentration. So there's about 20% solutes outside of the cell and 80% water. And within the cell, there is about a 20% solute concentration and 80% water. Solutes are just other substances that are dissolved within that water solution. So this could be salt, sugars, those sorts of things. As a consequence, the amount of water that moves in and out is a net zero. And the cell wall remains intact. 
and unaffected. You may also have a hypertonic solution. This means that the solution has a higher amount of solutes than the cell does. In the example listed, there is a 40% solute concentration and 60% water outside of the cell, whereas within the cell, there is only a 20% solution concentration and 80% of it is water. So which way do you think that the water will move? If you guessed that you thought that the water would move out of the cell, you would be correct. The water wants to move outside of the cell so that the concentration of the water is equal inside and outside. By moving out, you decrease the number of water molecules inside of the cell and increase it outside of the cell until they come into what is known as homeostasis or until the solution becomes isotonic again. Because water molecules are leaving the cell, you notice that the cell shrinks in size and this causes what we call crenations of the cell. As it shrinks, it warps the cell wall, or rather the cell membranes. Lastly, we see a hypotonic solution. So hypo means without or a lesser amount of water in the solution versus the cell. Sorry, a lesser amount of solvent molecules. If you look carefully at the figure, it says that there's, it's made up of 90% water and only 10% solution. So it's low in solutes. Inside of the cell, there's a 20% solute concentration and 80% water. Therefore, will the water travel in or out in a hypotonic solution? In a hypotonic solution, the water molecules will move into the cell. In order to try and dilute the concentration of solutes within the cell and potentially increase the concentration of solutes out of the cell until they reach homeostasis. homeostasis. Again, because in a hypotonic solution, the concentration of solutes out of the cell is less and water migrates into the cell, this causes the cell to inflate as it becomes more and more hydrated. This can have negative consequences for the cell. And these images, it shows just that. So the cell is made up of different components. It is made of a cell membrane, which is made up of lipids and is malleable, and a rigid cell wall. As we can see in an isotonic solution, the cell membrane fits snugly within the cell wall, but does not cause any sort of internal pressure or turgor pressure. However, in a hypertonic solution, where the water is leaving the cell in order to concentrate the solutes within the cell and reach homeostasis, the cell becomes dehydrated and that cellular membrane shrinks Upon shrinking, the cell membrane detaches from the cell wall, and this can lead to plasmolysis, or the breaking apart of the plasmid of the, uh, the inner membrane. Lastly, in a hypotonic solution, where the concentration of solutes is greater inside of the cell, the water will rush into the cell, causing that cellular membrane to expand and create a higher amount of osmotic pressure on the cell wall. The cell wall can help prevent the cell mem membrane from lysing. Although if the solution is too hypotonic, even under these conditions, eventually the cell may lyse or break apart. Okay, let's do checkpoint one. You may pause this if necessary. How would we describe the morphology of the bacteria seen in the microscopy image? You may need to zoom in or use a laptop or desktop to view the bacterium properly. Is it A, streptococci, B, streptobacilli, C, staphylococci, or D, spiral? Okay. Checkpoint two, 
How would we describe the morphology of the bacteria seen in the microscopy image? A. Streptococci B. Streptobacilli C. Staphylococci or D. Spiral Now let's discuss parts of the cell. We've already discussed briefly the nucleoid, which is the region containing the bacterial chromosomes. And we also have the plasmids, which are what we call extra chromosomal genetic elements. That is to say that they are not part of the nucleoid and they are separate um, little pieces of genetic information. As we can see in this image, the nucleoid region is, it's, ignore this dotted line, it's just kind of outlining where it is. It's not contained within a membrane, but it's kind of a condensed area of DNA found within, pro, within prokaryotes. This is difficult or impossible to see under light microscopy. Um, however, it can be viewed with the transmission electron microscope. If you're viewing bacteria with electron microscope with a light microscope, um, you probably won't see a nucleoid. So if you see a nucleus, you're uh, uh, probably looking at a eukaryote. Obviously, bacteria don't have nucleuses, but sometimes it's hard to tell the difference under uh, the resolution that light microscopes provide. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about plasmids. Plasmids are much smaller than the chromosomes. They are um, very small and they're always circular. That is, they don't have an end. While other organisms can occasionally contain plasmids, this is very rare and plasmids are associated with bacteria. Plasmids often contain helpful genes for survival, such as antibiotic resistance or resistance to other sort of stresses. However, these genes are not essential for basic biological functions. So you won't have genes that encode for the cell wall or for uh, the ribosomes or for producing ATP. These are more sort of extra genes that help them under certain, certain circumstances. Next up are the ribosomes, which are the area where proteins are synthesized. And we also have what we call the cytoplasm, which if you look at the cell, it is the watery substance that fills the inside of this cell. So it's where all of these other different components sort of float around inside of. Ribosomes are found in all domains of life. They are, they are cellular machinery that are used for protein manufacturing. And they're mostly identified by their size. Uh, this is called a Svedberg unit. And what it actually measures is the sedimentation rate or what layer becomes deposited within a sample that is spun down in an ultra centrifuge, which is just a machine that spins very rapidly in circles. And things that are heavier than the solution that it contains in will sink to the bottom. So the heavier it is, the deeper in the layer it will be submerged. Prokaryotic ribosomes that are found in the cytoplasm have a size of 70S. Um, and this is one of these little factoids that you will have to memorize. Inclusions are spaces where excess nutrients like glycogen, carbohydrates, starch, sulfur, phosphates, etc. are stored for a rainy day. The glycocalyx which literally means sugar coat, is a sticky substance that is secreted by bacterium and coats the outer cell. When it is well organized and tightly attached to the cell wall, it is called a capsule. The glycocalyx or capsule provides protection to the cell
from other cells from being attacked. In this way, it helps protect the cell from the host's immune system and contributes to the cell's ability to be virulent or cause disease. In this example, we can see that a positive test for, cap for a cell that has a capsule will result in kind of this halo-like image around the cell, whereas a negative reaction will have a lack of that halo. An example of an organism that uses capsules in order to protect itself from the host immune system is uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae. Only Streptococcus pneumoniae can cause pneumonia. pneumonia. An unorganized and loosely attached glycocalyx is enduringly called a slime layer. Slime layers allow cells to attach to each other, attach to services, and form what we call biofilms. 99% of bacterial cells in nature exist in the form of biofilms as seen in this image to the right. Uh, slime layers also can increase the virulence of organisms. For example, biofilms can form within a catheter, which prevent the organisms from being flushed away, allow them to attach and grow to the surface, the inner surfaces of the catheter. This can also occur in other parts of the human body and therefore increases their virulence. Next up is the flagella. Flagella are long appendages that propel the cell by rotating. They allow for something called chemotaxi, which is the movement toward or away from a chemical substance based upon its gradient of concentration. So if it wants to move towards a substance, substance say uh, a food source, it may follow the breadcrumbs from lowest concentration to a higher concentration. Um, the higher the concentration, the closer it gets to the food source. If it wants to move away from something, uh, then it will actually sense that chemical gradient and move where there is less and less of a concentration of that chemical in its environment. So uh, both of those are referred to as chemotaxi. We can also have phototaxi, and as you probably guessed, this is movement towards or away a of a light source, and this is also based upon the light intensity. Okay, so in these four images, we have different examples of flagella. In uh, image A, we have something called peritrichus. And in this image, peri means around, so we can find flagellum all the way around the cell, coming off of the cell. In image B, we have monotrichus. It's called monotrichus not because it's on the end here, but because there is a single flagellum. It is also called a polar flagellum because it is one of the, at one of the polar ends of the bacterium. The polar end is, is just, if you have a bacillus, it can, obviously this, is, this would be like a midpoint of the bacterium, but if you have it at either of the ends here, it's kind of at the um, one side or the other of the pill. Now, it's important to follow along with the definitions of the book and lecture because you might find different definitions for the next two. So, lophotrichus is a tuft uh, flagellum in one spot. Um, amphitrichus means that it's on two different spots. So in this example we have a, a tuft here and a tuft here. This one is also lophotrichus and polar because it's at a polar region and in D we have amphitrichus and polar because it's at both polar regions. Next are fimbriae which are short thin that adhere to other cells and surfaces to form biofilms. And here we have pili, 
which are similar in structure to fimbriae, but used for twitching motility and a very special source of genetic transfer called conjugation. In this image right here, we can see a pilus across two bacterial cells. And this is how a bacterium can transfer plasma DNA from one cell to another. Um, this occurs within a same generation instead of uh, from one generation to the next. And as a result, this is called horizontal gene transfer. This is very important to bacterium. As previously discussed, plasmids have non-essential genes that often contain um, genes that allow them to survive certain stressors. One of these can be antibiotics. So if one bacterium has a resistance to an antibiotic, that gene can quickly spread throughout a population through this method of conjugation. This paper here is not required for you to memorize. However, it's a interesting emerging uh, scientific technique to battle this uh, spread of antibiotic resistance. The title of this article is Potentiation of Curing by a Broad Host Range Self-Transmissible Vector for Displacing Resistance Plasmids to Tackle AMR. This was published on January 15th, 2020. And uh, in this figure right here, it shows the mechanism at which this occurs. So A is the mechanism that we outlined in the previous slides. You have a donor who has a plasmid. Here is called plasmid A. And you can imagine plasmid A might have some antibiotic resistance to it. So plasmid A is donated to recipient here. So now both of them have plasmid A and both of them have antibiotic resistance. And then when this bacterium and this bacterium go through binary fission, they pass it to their progeny. So now we have two different populations that have it. And again, uh, this new recipient here, this light blue colored recipient, can also pass it to a different type of bacterium that can now also have that antibiotic resistance. Now, there's an interesting mechanism for how plasmids are maintained. One might think, what's to cause this plasmid from being donated to both daughter cells during binary fission? How come only one daughter cell doesn't get it? And the answer to that is a system called a toxin-antitoxin system. So somewhere on the chromosome, a toxin might be created by this organism. And the cure for that toxin, called an antitoxin, is also encoded on the plasmid. So therefore, in order for these two progeny to survive, they must have a plasmid in each. If a progeny does not have that plasmid, this plasmid A, it will build up in toxins and pass away. So therefore, that's how you ensure a um, a pure culture that all of them have contained this plasmid. So scientists noticed this and they decided to make their own artificial plasmid that also contains that toxin antitoxin system. So here they've introduced a bacteria in this population, this orange bacterium, and this has what they call the P cure plasmid. So this has the cure to that toxin, this antitoxin here and they donate it to a bacterium that already has plasmid A. And now these two can compete for providing the antitoxin, the cure. And so when this bacterium has progeny cells, it doesn't have to retain the plasmid with the antibiotic resistance. Some cells can just contain the P cure. The P cure, however, the scientists conveniently left out the antibiotic resistance genes. So some of the uh, progeny of this bacterium no longer have antibiotic resistance. All right, let's move along to our next checkpoint, checkpoint three. How would we characterize the flagella on the bacteria seen in this microscopy image? A, peritrichus, 
B, monotrichus, C, lophotrichus, or D, amphitrichus. Now, we've briefly discussed this structure when we went over osmosis, but let's talk about it a little bit more. Bacteria have many layers on the outer part of the cell. Um, one of those layers is called the cell wall. The cell wall is a rigid layer and it's located beneath the capsule if it's present. So here's the capsule, we discussed that. And underneath that, you might find the cell wall. So here's an electron microscope image of what the cell wall looks like. And so it's labeled as CW. Um, we also have what we call the plasma membrane. So underneath the cell wall is the plasma membrane. And all that is, is uh, it's a lipid membrane. And uh, if you don't recall what a lipid is from previous biology classes, um, please take some time to look that up. So the function of the cell wall is very important. As discussed in osmosis, it helps maintain the shape of the cell. It also protects the very fragile cell membrane. And um, as a result, it prevents the cell from bursting due, due to excessive water intake. And Proteins also become embedded and stabilized within the cell wall, whereas they would not be so stabilized inside of a plasma membrane. So we can have our flagella anchored and stabilized in the cell wall. And as discussed before, um, uh, the cell wall is made up of peptidoglycan. We've covered this a little bit before. Peptidoglycan is a complex material and it's composed of rows of disaccharides, which are these uh, brownish reddish uh, strips here, and they are linked by these polypeptides here. So remember how we could divide bacterium into two types of cells, gram-positive cells and gram-negative cells? Let's take a look at the anatomy of a gram-positive cell wall. So a gram-positive cell wall, um, if you remember the stain of a, of a crystal violet um, after it's formed a crystal violet iodine complex, it's really hard to remove from the cells and that's why they remain purple after staining after de-staining. And that is due to the many layers of peptidoglycan that are present in the cell wall of gram-positive uh, bacteria. So here we see this very thick, rigid um, peptidoglycan, which makes it thick and rigid. Uh, also things that are unique to gram-negative bacterium are these tachoic and lipotachoic and all you need to know about tachoic and lipotachoic acids are that they improve the stability of the cell wall. Um, tachoic acids uh, are only cell wall deep, whereas lipotachoic acids, as you can see, penetrate all the way down into the, uh, the plasma membrane, also known as the inner membrane. Um, Gram-positive uh, cell walls are shown here having porins but um, gram-negative bacterium also have porins, and all these are our channels to allow for molecules to go in and out of the cell. So in this uh, electron microscope image, we can see here's this thick peptidoglycan, here's this cell membrane, and here's the uh, cytoplasm. Okay, here is a depiction of a gram-negative cell wall. And gram-negative cell walls also have peptidoglycan. Um, however, they have fewer layers of peptidoglycan.
therefore, their cell walls tend to be thinner and less rigid. Although there's a lot of complexity to the cell walls of gram-negatives, they have what is known as a periplasm. The periplasm is a space that's low sandwiched between two different membranes. So they have a inner membrane called the plasma membrane or the cell membrane, and they have an outer membrane. So gram positives don't have an outer membrane. Remember, they just have that thick peptidoglycan cell wall. And sandwiched in between the two is the peptidoglycan. And the peptidoglycan therefore lies within the periplasm or the periplasmic space. And I want you to note in gram-negative cells, there is no tachoic acid. Okay, now this image shows you uh, what a gram-negative cell wall looks like under an electron microscope. Here we see the very thin cellular membrane right here. And then we have our periplasmic space followed by the thin peptidoglycan layer, which is right here. And then this very thin uh, outer membrane right here. Now, I'm not gonna have you draw a electron microscope image and know exactly where all of these lines lay. However, you should be able to do a very crude drawing of a gram negative or a gram positive uh, cell membrane. We don't need you to be able to draw, you know, exactly how these lipids work. But if you can draw a square or a line and label that cell membrane, and then leave a space and label that periplasmic space, and then draw another line and label that peptidoglycan, and then draw one more line and label it the outer membrane. And you can draw these lipopolysaccharides that gram-negative bacterium have. Or if we go to the next image here, you can draw lines through the peptidoglycan and through the peptidoglycan to the, uh, the inner membrane to indicate tachoic acids. That'll be good enough. Again, I'm not looking for a artistic representation of a gram positive or a gram negative bacterium. All I'm looking for is that you understand the structures and where they exist in space and which ones are present in a gram positive and which ones are present in a gram negative. Um, you will be required to be able to draw these just with very distinct lines. So if you draw the lines too close together in order to create a sense of uh, ambiguity so that I cannot quite tell which, which area you're pointing to with your labeling, then I will deduct points. So you should make nice and clear drawings of each one of these areas. And one more thing that I want to make note of is that even though the thick peptidoglycan layer of bacterium uh, provides a lot of rigidity and protection to the bacterium. It also makes it a wonderful target for antibiotics. So there are a variety of different chemical compounds that actually degrade and break apart peptidoglycan or interfere with the synthesis of peptidoglycan and by doing so are toxic to um, gram-positive bacterium. Here we have checkpoint four, which asks, gram-negative bacteria do not have blank. A, peptidoglycan, B, periplasmic space, C, outer membrane, or D, tachoic acids. All right, checkpoint five. Penicillins are an, are an effective 
antibiotic against gram-positive bacteria. They disrupt the structure of peptidoglycan. However, penicillins are much less effective against gram-negative bacteria. Why? Now let's talk about a different type of cell wall, the acid fast cell wall. These contain a layer of mycolic acids, which are, are long chain fatty acids outside of the layers of the peptidoglycan. And as we've seen with other things that are on the outside of the cell wall, they provide a protective effect and uh, specific antibiotics must be used for these. So here's an example of an acid fast bacteria. We can see it has the layer of the cell membrane, the peptidoglycan, and then this mycolic acid, a fatty acid or lipid layer, which is uh, thick and on the outside. Examples of these that organisms that contain this are like mycobacterium that cause tuberculosis and leprosy. Okay, so we've already kind of discussed the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is the one that is right outside of the cytoplasm and houses the cytoplasm. It's a selectively permeable barrier that encloses the internal structures of the cell. So essentially the plasma membrane acts as the gatekeeper that decides what sort of nutrients or products go into the cell and what sort of uh, toxins or other things are excreted outside of the cell. Next up are endospores. Um, endospores are a type of cell. They're not just a matter of what's going on with the cell wall, but they are a, 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 a change in, in the uh, structure and nature of a cell entirely. So these are extremely robust um, uh, resting cells and they are formed inside certain species during environmental stresses. So here we see um, we have active normal cells. These are the pink cells here and um, they are referred to as vegetative cells. Strangely enough, when we think, you know, vegetative, we, we kind of think in a, in a state of inactivity, but the vegetative cells are the active ones. And the endospores are the ones that have kind of uh, built this sort of a, a bombshell of a structure in order to be ready for uh, another time that has less environmental stress. So it's a survival mechanism. So this here shows uh, the different traits of each type of cell. Vegetative cells tend to be sensitive to extreme temperatures and radiation, whereas endospores are resistant to extreme temperatures and radiation. Vegetative cells are going to be your gram-positive cells. Um, however, endospores, they don't absorb gram stain, and so uh, as a result, you'll need a special endospore staining technique Vegetative cells have normal water content and the enzymes that carry out chemical reactions inside of the cell have a normal activity. Endospores are much more dehydrated and there's a very low, um, you know, in the book it says no metabolic activity, but um, it's so little that they just refer to it as no metabolic activity probably to help you differentiate between the two. Vegetative cells are capable of active growth and metabolism. And as you can imagine, endospores are dormant, so they don't experience growth or metabolic activity. Okay, so we're just going to very briefly discuss the process of so step one, the DNA replicates. So here we have a second copy of the chromosome here, or copies, depending on the, the type of bacterium. And so this is the nucleoid over here. And we have membranes that start to form around the DNA. 
and then what we call a four spore forms, which contains additional membranes here. And I know it's a little bit difficult to uh, see, but just imagine there are extra layers of membranes that are added to the, this four spore, the second cell that's coming off the side here. Then a protective cortex forms around the spore. Now the cortex contains peptidoglycan. All right, step five here is a protein coat forms around the cortex. And then the spore is released. And so this is called sporulation, step one through six. Um, the process of a spore becoming a vegetative cell, we're not going to go into uh, any detail about that, except for it's referred to as germination, which is um, uh, kind of easy to remember because if you imagine a seed, a seed germinates into a plant, so a spore germinates into a vegetative cell. I hope that helps a little. So these spores can hang around for a very, very long time. Um, here is a paper that analyzed, they call the ultrastructure, and that's just um, subcellular level structure. So maybe what's inside of the cell, um, different parts of that spore. And so they found intact bacterial spores in the skin of an Egyptian mummy. And they showed that the bacterial spore had characteristic appearances with a core, a cortex, a coat, and what they call the exosporium. And that will wrap up chapter three, part one. Stay tuned for chapter three, part two. Thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you next time.